In the last video we have seen how to test an association using the chi square test and in this video I want to show you how to measure this association. And having seen chi square as a test statistics for association, you might come with the idea that chi square already is a good uh, measurement of this association. And it's partially true. Why it's not totally true, um, I will show you in this video. So we start with a very simple case with the amber uh, situation that we had also in the last video, where we have some amber finds that come from settlements and burials and we have also sites where there are no amber present and together they form this kind of matrix here so settlement with amber and settlements without amber and ah, I have a typo here so let's better have it like that so settlements with amber and without amber and burial sites with amber and without amber and um, the thing is she square is yeah, kind of a measurement for association but it also depends not only on the strength of the association but also on other parameters like degree of freedom and number of cases that we have for example if we take the she square test of our amber you can see that's a significant um, association and if I remove the correction um, we can see the plain she square value here is 24 something so if I now double the sides in our data set so now we have 12 instead of 6 and so on in total we have now 400 sides um, if I again make the chi-square test, um, you can see the p-value is smaller, as it should be, because we have more cases. But the chi-square value is also doubled, so it depends strongly on the number of cases that we see. Although the association hasn't changed as such, because there is still um, the same ratio between uh, settlements with and without amber and burials with and without amber and sites with amber, the ratio between settlement and burials and so on. So that's something we want to have for a test because here we have to reflect on the number of cases that we have to have a more certain or less certain um, significant result. But if we just want to measure this association, we have to get rid of these other dependencies. And we will see later on how we can achieve that. But let's start before with a more simple measure of uh, association and that's Joule's Q. Um, Joule's Q, um, I will just introduce the specific situation and build on top of that the Joule's Q um, function. So we have um, simple two by two matrix here just like we have it in the amber case so with settlements with amber represents this a category settlements without amber for example this b category uh, burials with amber c and burials without amber d and if there is a strong association between amber and settlements for example we would have all the high numbers on this diagonal. So most of the settlements would have amber, while most of the sites that are not a settlement, or else in that case, would not have amber. Then we would have a strong positive association. On the other hand, and that's here the case, um, when settlements are negative associated with amber, we would have this diagonal dominant. So most of the high numbers should be in this diagonal. Um, most of the settlements should not have amber, while most of the other sites um, should have amber. So we have to, to have an idea about the strength of the association. We have to relate the diagonals here to the total number of cases that we have. And that's what Joule's Q is doing.
So let me put up the formula for Joule's Q. It's that one here. So Joule's Q takes the diagonals here, subtract from the positive diagonal the negative diagonal, and we multiply the individual places in the diagonal. So if we have a strong positive association, then this number gets very high, while this number stays rather low. If we have this very negative association, this diagonal is dominant, so this number gets very high, this is rather low, we can get a negative, high negative value up here, while in the other case we would get a high positive value up here. And if the uh, values are distributed even among the fields, then we would have uh, in uh, total a very low number here. And then we relate that to the total number of cases that we have by adding up these diagonals and norm normalize the whole term by that. So Joule's Q gives you a value between minus 1 and 1. Minus 1 means strong negative association, while 1 means strong positive association, or better, perfect positive association. Um, the number of cases are um, normalized by the lower part here, by the denominator, so uh, the whole thing becomes independent from the number of cases, um, which in turn gives you the idea that even if we have a strong association, um, it might not be necessarily um, significant because we don't care about the number of cases here. So now we have the formula and we want to whole, have the whole thing working in R. And in the base package there is no Joule's Q function uh, implemented. There is one function in the psych package that we could use. But on the one hand, we don't want to have extra dependencies now and load extra packages here, if not necessary. And on the other hand, uh, it is a good occasion to practice how we can produce our own function. And that's what we are doing now. And we take the formula as, as recipe and build from that our function. So let me get my notes back. OK. Um, a function R always has a name and an assignment of a function, an input variable, an output variable, and a body within which something is done to come from the input to the output variable. So our function should be called calc Jules Q, and there is the assignment, and I assign something as a function with a specific um, command that's function and we want to have an input variable and I name that x. Most of the time they are called just simply x, if, especially if it's such a simple function. And then I will have a body of the function. That body is uh, encapsulated in these curly brackets. And from that I want to return in the end, turn my value that I call Jules Q. So now we have to come in the body from the X to the Jules Q. And how this can be done, we can see from the formula. So we will have an, um, a nomin nominator, uh, what's, what's the English term for that? Uh, numerator and a denominator. So the numerator is above the uh, line here and the uh, denominator is below the line. So our Joule's Q in the end should come from the numerator after divided by the denominator. So now we have to we have split up our problem. Our problem has become smaller. Now we have to define the numerator and the denominator. And we can get that from the formula. So the numerator is a times d minus b times c. And we can see this here as a matrix. Our x represents the whole matrix here. So a is 
uh, first row, first column. D is second row, second column. So x11 one, one, times x22 two, two. and from that we subtract x12 times x21. Let me make this a bit nicer. Okay, and now the denominator is also quite simple. We can just take the same term here and exchange this minus by a plus, and then we have that. With that, we have turned this formula into an R function. And when I run this whole thing, you can see up here in the environment there is a new function appearing. It's all our call Jules Q, which is a function, and we can use that from now on. So let's see how uh, our Ember um, will result in which yield Jules Q. Calc Jules Q from Ember, and the result is minus 0 0.8, so it's a negative association as we have expected that, and it's a rather strong association, having in mind that Jules Q uh, ranges from minus 1 to 1. This is already a rather strong association. Okay, and we can also see that it's independent from the number of cases. If I multiply that by 2, we get the same value out here. So that's a very simple um, function for calculating the um, association. The downside is it works only in a 2x2 two two case, 2x2 uh, two two table here, like that. And um, to extend that, we need another function to have it independent from the number of rows and columns that we have in our data. Before we can go to that, I will introduce phi, uh, which is another uh, measurement of association, which also only works on two by two cases, um, but we can extend that later on. Or so um, phi, the formula for phi is rather similar, a bit more complicated. We have the same uh, numerator up here, but the dominate denominator looks different because now we divide um, our uh, diagonals here by the sum of the first column times the second column times the first row times the second row and from that we take the square root and this also normalize our data uh, our, our value in the range of minus one to one and gives us a different value, but still it's a measurement of association. Um, in this time it's phi. Okay, how we can come to um, a function, a working function from that formula? Kind of like we have done that before with Jules Q, but this time we want to have a function that calculates phi. The numerator stays the same. The denominator is a bit different because we have um, we have different places here and I just will copy and paste that over because it's really just um, effort and not very intelligent work. So we have 1 1 a plus b which is second row first column and so on and so forth and with that we have here the lower part we have not the square root yet and we introduce the square root down here and we will return not Jules Q but phi and also here it's phi now and we can now calc phi from for amber and we can see again we have a negative association. The value is smaller, but still it is in the range of minus one to one. It just behaves a bit different, but still it gives you a measurement of the association. And if you want to compare that, you have to name what kind of measurement you have used, Jules Q or phi. One of the nice things about phi is that 
it is uh, related to chi square and that we will use now to turn our chi square value into a valid um, measurement of association. So let me put up another formula. Phi, uh, the square of phi, or uh, squared uh, phi to the power of 2, is equal to chi square divided by the number of cases in the 2 by 2 situation, like we have it here. Or to put it the other way around, the absolute value of phi is equal to the square root of chi square divided by the number of cases. And with that, we can use our chi square value in the 4 by uh, 2 by 2 case situation um, to also calculate phi. To show you that, I make a small variable that I call test and I put in that the chi square of the amber and it should not be corrected. And the result is the chi square test. But if we look to the structure that's behind this output variable t here, we can see there are different um, other values. And one of the values that's quite interesting for us now is the statistics value, because here we get the chi square value back. And that's what we want. So t dollar statistics gives us the chi squared value back. And if I divide that by the sum of amber, so the total number of cases, I get 0 0.12342222. And if I calculate our phi from the amber and put that to the power of 2, I get the same value here. So I will not prove that this is valid. I just show you this empirically and you have to just trust that this is the case and other people have proved that. Okay, with that we can now use chi square probably as a measure of um, association if we get rid of the number of cases that we have. The thing is chi square not only depends on the number of cases but also on the degrees of freedom and I can show you that in a small example also most of the time I just copy paste that here. So let's assume we have a matrix that's like that. 60 cases in total divided here on this diagonal. So a perfect positive association. All the situations, uh, all the, for example, settlements have the amber while the other sides are all without amber. And if I make the chi square test of this situation, one. I'm not correcting it. I get a chi square value of 60 because that's the maximum divergence from a um, equal distribution that we can achieve with this situation here. So we have we would expect 15 here and 15 here together. It's uh, a divergence of 30, and this is for two situations here and also in that direction, so we get end up with 60. Um, if we extend this matrix by to a 3 by 3 matrix, we have the same number of cases here, but distributed over 3 columns and 3 rows. And if I make the same chi square test here, with our second matrix, we get a chi square value of 120. Um, also, p value is different, although we still have the same number of cases here. So, you can see this is the influence of the degrees of freedom. And if I take that even more to, to the extreme and take that matrix here, 4x4 four four matrix, and make the same chi square test here. we have 180 as chi square value. Um, this warning comes from um, two little uh, expected values here. Okay, so we have to um, also normalize against the number of cases here. And our basic situation is the 2 by 2 table. 
and we have to normalize the result to a 2 by 2 table. I just give you the formula for what will be the output of that. And that's, in the end, it's Kramer's, Kramer's V, where we take the chi-square value, divide that by the number of cases, like up here, and additionally multiply the number of cases by the minimum of rows and columns minus 1. So in the 2 by 2 situation, the minimum of rows and columns would be 2, minus 1 is 1, n would be uh, n times 1, so it wouldn't change, and we are back in this situation, we calculate phi here. And if we have more rows and columns, um, it is the degrees of freedoms change accordingly, and so we have to reflect that. If it's, for example, 3, then 3 minus 1 would be 2, so the number of cases would be doubled. And if we look back here, we had our 2 by 2 situation there where we had a chi square of 60. And in the 3 by 3 situation, we had a chi square value of 120, so it would be double the chi square value. We halve that, and then we get to a situation that's comparable to the 2 by 2 situation. So with Kramer's V, now we be, have become independent from the number of rows and columns, and also from the number of cases. Okay, again, we make a function for that, that we have it working in R. And also, this is also reflected or present in the Psych package, but it's not a very dramatic function, so we can really write that down. We again need the same structure like up here, so I just copy paste that as a uh, scaffold. I call the return value CV and also here. And the numerator and the denominator will be different. What we also can see is that instead of having this um, the square root only for the denominator, we have the square root for the whole thing. So I just put that here in front. And now the denominator is the chi square value, so we have to calculate that. Chi square test from x, and we extract the statistics. Statistic, and we want to have it uncorrected. Correct should be false. And the denominator is the number of cases, and the minimum of rows and columns minus 1, so the number of cases is sum of x times the minimum of the dimensions of x minus 1. Okay, with that we have our calculate Kramer's uh, V function. We can use that on Amber. It gives us this value here and calc phi of amber. You can see it's the same, but this time it's absolute. Kramer's phi only works in the 0 to 1 range, so it doesn't give you an indication about the direction of the association, it just gives you an indication about the strength of the association. And in 2 by 2 situation, it's um, equivalent or it's the same like the normal phi uh, measurement, but we can also use that on on our test 1, which is this matrix, which gives us a perfect association, and the 2, which also gives us a perfect association, and in the 3 situation, with this four columns and rows also a perfect association and a valid result from that. Okay, now we have learned three different measurements of associations. Um, the most simple is dual skew. Then we also introduced phi, but only to step from phi to Kramer's phi um, to have a measurement of association of tables that are larger than 2 by 2. And with that, you can measure how strong association between your variables is. That's, for, that's all for now. Next time we will talk about the Fisher test, which is a test that is applicable in the situation where this occurs, where we not have enough um, 
um, where we have not enough cases, for example, lower than 50, uh, n is smaller than 50, or where we have the situation that the expected value is below 5, which also rules out a chi-square test. So in that case, you can use Fischer's uh, exact test and how this is done, we will see in the next episode.